Thanks, Corrine, for that beautiful scripture reading. Good evening, Redeemer. If you haven't already, please turn your Bibles to Isaiah 53. Welcome to our first Good Friday service in the history of Redeemer. If we haven't met, my name is Alan Mandap, and I serve as a pastoral assistant for Redeemer Church of Dubai. And it's, it's always a joy and a delight to open up God's Word with you. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Father, you are worthy to be praised. You are worthy to be worshipped. Father, we ask that this evening open our minds and our hearts to understand the Scriptures. Sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. About nine years ago, I was reading the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, and I clearly remember I was barely a Christian. I'm not even sure if I'm a Christian. Barely know anything about the Bible, but I vividly remember tears running down my eyes. This is one of the most vividly gruesome and horrifying, agonizing pain that, can, uh, that a person can ever have. Yet Isaiah 53 is one of the most beautiful chapters in the Bible. The great Charles Spurgeon said that this is the Bible in miniature. This is the gospel in essence. And Isaiah really is divided into um, three, three um, uh, structures, which actually Dr. Adam Brown uh, helped us to see earlier. So I'm going to skip that. And really, when you look at the book of Isaiah, it's so fascinating. It's like you're on a roller coaster. At one point, you see God's judgment, and then suddenly, hope. At one point, you'd see God's justice, and then suddenly, grace and mercy. God's wrath, and suddenly, God's love. That's beautiful. And that's even true for this chapter, Isaiah chapter 53. But there's an endless debate just to try and answer, who is this servant? Is it Israel? Is it Isaiah? Is it someone else? And why did he have to suffer so much? But actually, the answer is found in Acts chapter 8. Some of you might be familiar with the story. So there's this Ethiopian eunuch, and he was in charge with the treasuries in, in whole Ethiopia. And then um, he was going to Jerusalem to worship, and as he was going, he was reading the book of Isaiah. And then Philip, the disciple of Jesus, uh, led by the Spirit to approach this eunuch. And when Philip uh, approached the eunuch, he asked, Do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch said, How can I unless someone guides me? And knowing Philip, the evangelist that he is, from this chapter, he opened his mouth and talked about the good news about Jesus. And that's my goal tonight. From this chapter, by God's Spirit, I want to show us the gospel of Jesus Christ. Needless to say, the answer to the question, who is this? This is talking about Jesus. He is the servant mentioned here. And really, we're going to see tonight um, that Jesus is the exalted Savior, was pierced for our transgressions, was crushed for our iniquities, and by faith, we can be made righteous. So if you are here tonight and you only leave this place with one thing, I pray that, that this would be it. That Jesus was pierced for our transgressions, that he was crushed for our iniquities, and by faith in his name, we can be made righteous. We're going to look at three linking phrases just to 
see what this uh, chapter is all about. So let me just give it to you. The exalted servant suffered for our sake to make us righteous. So that's our three phrases, or you can say three points. So one, the exalted servant suffered for our sake. And really in this second phrase, we're going to spend a lot of time uh, because we're going to look at 11 verses. And the third, to make us righteous. Why don't we dive in now uh, and let's look at the first one, the exalted servant. Let me read from verse 13. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up, and he shall be exalted. We've seen the same language earlier from Isaiah 40 to right, where uh, Dr. Brown led us beautifully. And God is saying, behold, pay attention. Look at my servant. Look and hear and listen what I'm about to say about him. And Redeemer, we would do well to pay attention. What else did we found? He said, he will be high and he shall be lifted up. He will be exalted. But how is he going to be exalted? Is it through his suffering? And that takes us to our second point, suffered for our sake. And as I mentioned earlier, we're going to spend a lot of time here uh, because we're going to go through 11 verses But let's look at verse 14. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. What does that mean? I've heard people talk about this and say, you know, Jesus is not good looking. He's no Tom Cruise. He's no Brad Pitt. He's just a carpenter. But this verse is not talking about that. This is prophesying what he's going to look like on his way to the cross. He's going to experience agonizing pain. He's going to be disfigured. He's going to be mutilated. We won't even recognize him. Psalm 22 gives us a vivid picture of this. Let me just read a couple It says, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. My strength is dried up. You lay me in the dust of death. You have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing, they cost lots. It's hard to listen to these verses without thinking about the cross. But look at verse 15. So shall he sprinkle many nations. And when we see the word sprinkle, it can also be translated startle or astonish, or they're going to be surprised. Why? Look again. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which, he has, which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard, they understand. Meaning, the nations will be speechless. It's not just about Israel, but all the nations, all the kings of the earth will be speechless. Why? Because whatever the servant is going uh, to do, whatever suffering is going to do, it will also benefit them, not just the nation of Israel. Now let's look at chapter 53, verse 1. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Or more accurately, who has believed our report? Who has believed the gospel? In John 12, the apostle John said that despite the many signs and wonders and miracles that Jesus did, many of the Jews did not believe. And maybe even some of us here have not yet believed. And that's not surprising. Just look at verse 2. For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. 
That's how the servant is going to be. There's no beauty in him. There's no splendor. There's nothing impressive. There's nothing grander about him. And the nation of Israel, they have been waiting, waiting for their Messiah. But they want someone impressive. They want the biggest person in the room like King Saul or the giant killing warlords like David. Not an, an educated carpenter. Definitely not someone from Nazareth. In fact, look at verse 3. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. This is just outright rejection. They can't even look at him. They don't value him. They even look away from him. He's a man of sorrows. He's the man who has experienced pain and suffering more than anyone on the planet. Let's look at verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. When they saw this suffering servant, they thought, oh, he's being punished because of his own sin. God is punishing him, his suffering because of his own sin. But actually, he is bearing our sins. Let's look at verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and by his stripes or his wounds, we are healed. That, that should be us. All of us here are wretched people. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We deserve to be pierced for our transgressions. We deserve to be crushed for our iniquities. But God... But Jesus was pierced for us. Jesus was crushed for us. Jesus was chastised for us. Jesus was wounded and beaten for us. And by his wounds, we are healed. Why would he do that? Why? Look at verse 6. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has lived on him the iniquity of us all it's because we turn our back on god we wandered off we are like sheep mindless sheep we didn't care about him we didn't we just do whatever we wanted we played gods we rebelled against him instead of god punishing us what did he do god laid our sins on him. All of our idolatry, our adultery, our fornication, our lust, our covetousness, murder, hatred, pride, envy, disrespect, drunkenness, strife, division, brokenness, and the list goes on and on and on and on. All of them were laid on Jesus. And he walked the path via Dolorosa. The path on the way to the cross is our substitute. That's why in verse 7 we'll see he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In the previous verse, we were compared, we, were compared as a rebellious, mindless sheep. Now in verse 7, it was Jesus who was compared to a sheep. But a sheep in his final days, like a lamb, 
to the slaughter. He was silent. Now, I don't recommend you do this, but I've watched a couple of videos online to see uh, about a sheep being slaughtered. And I saw head tied to their feet as they are being led to be slaughtered. There's nothing you would hear. There isn't anything. Pure silence. No protest. No resistance. And in the same way, Jesus was silent, beginning from his betrayal to his arrest on the way to the cross, he was silence. No resistance, no protest, pure silence. He has all the right to say no. He has all the right to complain. He could have said, why am I being punished for the sins that I did not commit? I am innocent. I am guilty. But Jesus submitted willfully to the Father like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. When the Apostle John saw Jesus, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the Passover Lamb, the Lamb who will bear our sins and be slaughtered as our substitute, the Lamb who will be taken away. And indeed, he was taken away. Look at verse 8. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. He was oppressed. Justice was denied. He was killed for our transgression. Who considered it? Who protested for him? Who defended him? No one. Not even his disciples. All of them fled. One of them betrayed him. One of them denied him three times. He died. He was buried. Look at verse 9. And they made his grave with the wicked. And with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit found in his mouth. He was buried with the rich, a rich man's tomb. He was not even permitted to be buried with the poor whom he loves. And in the context of Israel, if you are buried with the rich, you are considered a sinner. But notice the last part of verse 9. It says, not only that the lamb is silent, but he was innocent. There was no deceit found in his mouth. He was sinless from submission to innocence. But why did he suffer excruciating pain and rejection? Why? To make us righteous. And that's our third point. We sin against God. We deserve to be punished. Yet, yet, look at verse 10. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. Wait, what did we just read? It was God's will to crush his own son? This doesn't make any sense. You know, when Christians die, they die with comfort. They die with confidence that God is with them. And that is true. But when Jesus died, he cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God forsake him because he was bearing the sin of the world, our sins. God was pleased to crush his own son. But how can a good God crush and even be pleased by crushing his own son? Hear this, Redeemer. 
God's pleasure in crushing his own son is not, was not in his pain but for his purpose. For, it, what, for what will it accomplish? For what it will bring about? Look at verse 10. Again, when his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall, he shall see his offspring. So God was pleased to crush his son because it will produce a multitude of adopted sons and daughters. It will produce a people of God. None of us, none of us can bear the eternal, holy wrath of God. Our sin needs to be atoned for. Christ's suffering was necessary. It was the only way that we can be made right with God. Friends, this is how vast, how wide, how deep God's love for you and for me. That he would crush his only son. <laughs> that means nothing of this is, is an accident. This is all part of God's sovereign, providential, redemptive plan. Even you coming here now on your seat, this is not an accident. I know you've heard this before. It's not an accident that you're here, but that's true. Because not, none of this is an accident. Everything is according to God's plan. Maybe it's your colleague who invited you here. Maybe a friend, a relative. Or maybe you saw us on Facebook or Instagram. God willed that you're going to sit on that chair. God willed that you're going to hear this good news. In verse 1 of chapter 53, we've seen people who have rejected him, who did not believe him. Let me ask you, friend, what's preventing you now from believing? Don't be one of them. Receive this free gift of grace. Or maybe you're asking, why would I even believe a dead servant? And that's a valid question. But let me tell you, he did not remain dead. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He will die. And yes, indeed he died. But this is not how the story is going to end. He's coming back to life. Jesus will come out the victor from this suffering. Last November, we had the privilege to visit Israel uh, along with other GTS students. And one of the places that we visited is the tomb of Jesus. And guess what? What we saw. The tomb is still empty. It's still empty. That's good news. But what's in it for us? What's in it for us? Look at verse 11. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. By dying on the cross, Jesus accomplished our justification. We are accounted righteous. Yes, we were enemies of God, but by faith in Jesus, we are declared righteous. Listen to this, Redeemer. Jesus takes our sin and he gives us his righteousness. Then he goes to the cross bearing all of our sin and shame and then he paid everything in full. Then after three days, he came back to life 
he came up, he came back victorious, defeating death and sin. And verse 12 is actually an attestation for that. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressions, for the transgressors. These are victory words. This is a victory parade for someone who's won the war. He's become one of us and defeated sin and death on our behalf. And he's now reigning. And he's now seated at the right hand of God, interceding for us, for me, and for you, for everyone who believe. Redeemer, let's remind ourselves of this not only on good Friday, but every day. Let's not be too familiar with this gospel to the point that when we hear it, we, we just grow cold. May this melt our hearts and lead us to worship the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And if you are visiting us today, and maybe this is your first time hearing this, I urge you to consider this. Jesus was pierced for your transgressions. He was crushed for your iniquities. And by faith in his name, you can be made righteous. And when Jesus died on the cross, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world has been slain. And then... The curtain in the temple that separates God and man was torn from top to bottom. It is finished. It is done. Would you receive this free gift of grace? Back when I was in college, I was still pursuing political economics. That's that's when before they introduced a lot of mathematics, so I dropped that course and shifted to another. But my professor said this, maybe this is the only thing I remember from, from that course, but he said this, there is no free lunch. And what he means by that is maybe it's free for the person who's receiving it, but actually someone has paid for it. Someone has paid the price for you to have it free. Someone cost something. Nothing is absolutely free, economically speaking. One way or another, someone has cost something. And that's also true for us. We received God's grace for free. We don't do anything to be saved. We are saved by grace. Someone has paid the price for us to have it free. And he paid it with his own precious blood through agonizing pain and suffering and even separation from his father. No works to be done, no prayers to be prayed, no charity to be given. Jesus paid it all. This is the price that bought our redemption. And even as we partake communion today, let's remember this truth. Let me close by reading from Philippians chapter 2. I was deciding whether to read this or not, but I will read it anyway. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. Have this in mind, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form. 
He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. From humility to exaltation, this is Jesus. Let's pray. Oh, Father, what a marvelous truth. What can we ever give to earn your favor? There's nothing. But you gave us everything. You gave us your one and only Son, despite our countless rejections and transgressions. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying a death we could never die. May we live a life worthy of the gospel. We pray this in your name. Amen.